All right, engineers, in this video, we're going to go over the uh, hemoglobin oxygen disassociation curve. So this is just going to be a nice little way of recapping everything we talked about in internal and external respiration, but seeing it in a more graphical representation. OK, so when we look here, we're going to have a y-axis and an x-axis. On the y-axis, this is going to be representing the percent saturation of the hemoglobin. Now, when we talk about percent saturation, what, what do we mean by percent saturated? It's how much oxygen, the percentage of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin. So that's what percent saturation means. So the percent, and I'm going to put sat, the percent saturation, oh, I wrote that again, double, percent saturation of hemoglobin, OK, HB. And again, what does this percent saturation of hemoglobin mean? It means it's the amount of oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin in percent form. That's it. So now that's the y-axis. On the x-axis, we're going to have the partial pressure of oxygen. Particularly, uh, we're going to use it in millimeters of mercury. OK. So now we have x-axis partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury. On the y-axis, we have percent saturation of hemoglobin. Good. That's good. Now, what do we see in this curve? When we see this curve, look at this. When we start over here at about, let's say that we come over here at about 104. I'm going to start moving, moving as the partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing. Look what happens. As the partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing, it's kind of staying the same. Nothing's really changing. Nothing's really changing. Oh, but it starts to go down, 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 down. And it makes kind of like a S-shaped. When it makes some, some of it this S-shaped, that's a specific type of curve. So that curve is called a sigmoidal curve. So this curve is specifically called a sigmoidal curve. So this is a sigmoidal curve. It's kind of like an S-shaped curve. And what it's trying to represent is that this is kind of the plateau phase. So, so no matter how much more oxygen you add on, no matter what, it's not going to change the percent saturation of hemoglobin. So for example, just for example, it doesn't have to be perfect, but if we come up here to about 60, and we go from 60 all the way here to about 110, no matter how much more oxygen I have, it's not going to change the percent saturation of hemoglobin. It's still going to remain at about 98% saturated, OK? But as we go over here, maybe about 50, all the way down here to about 10, as I start moving my way down, and this partial pressure of oxygen starts decreasing, then the percent saturation starts decreasing significantly. And we're going to explain what's happening. So now, what is the normal? So we're going to take this black line here. This is representing, the black line is representing normal situations, no, no changes, nothing abnormal. We'll talk about the, the changes in the pink and the orange. But first, let's focus on the black one, which is just normal. In normal physiological conditions, what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs and in the systemic arterial blood? You know that that's right around here. So look, it's about right there. Because you know you have 100, 110. Right in between there is about 104. That's the number we want. Let's write that down then. So right here, about that point right there, I should have 104 millimeters of mercury. And where should this be? This should be in the lungs. So if this is in the lungs, let's follow this up to that black line now. OK, so if we follow this up in this black line, let's do this in this nice blue. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to move up, and I'm going to move this way now. So now look, I'm going to come over this way. We're going to get it to about right there. Not perfect. You know, not a perfect line here, but I just want you guys to get the point here. If I come down here to about that point. So it's going to fall right in between this. Now, technically, if we were to be really, really specific, it should fall uh, right in around 98%. Obviously, it looks, it looks like a half, 95, but in the lungs, it should be 97, 98% saturated. OK, so this is going to be where? This is in the lungs. OK, so let's write that right over here. So this is going to be in the lungs. Now what happens is, after you have this gas exchange that occurs in the lungs, right? So you know there's gas exchange in the lungs, and that's where the actual, the actual oxygen is moving, right? So the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is 104 millimeters of mercury. It'll move from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillary blood until the pulmonary capillary blood has a partial pressure of oxygen that's about 104 millimeters of mercury. Then it'll go to the systemic arterial blood. When it goes to the systemic arterial blood, it'll get, then get transported to our tissues. You know what the normal partial pressure of oxygen is of our resting tissues? It's generally on 40 millimeters of mercury. 
So here at about 40 millimeters of mercury, this is the point in which our tissues, so this is the point in which our tissues are at rest. Okay, so it's usually the resting point for our tissues. So this is the resting point of my tissues. Let's see what the big difference is between 104 millimeters of mercury, so the partial pressure of oxygen, 104 millimeters of mercury, which is in the lungs and the systemic arterial blood, versus the partial pressure of oxygen in our tissue cells, so the muscle tissue. So now let's follow this bad boy up. So if I follow this bad boy up here, I come up to this point here, and I move over, nice. Right there, at about where it's supposed to be, around 75%. So this is usually the partial pressure of oxygen in the actual, uh, specifically after gas exchange has occurred. So because, watch this. This, if I come up here, what did I tell you? This is the partial pressure of oxygen where? In two places. It's the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs because that's where the gas exchange is occurring. Oxygen is moving from the lungs into the blood. The other part where it's 104 millimeters of mercury is the systemic arterial blood. Then, the systemic arterial blood is taking the oxygen, taking it in the form of the blood, to the tissue cells and dropping that oxygen off to the tissue cells. The normal partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is 40 millimeters of mercury. Now, after the gas exchange occurs, after the oxygen has been dropped off to the tissues, we see that the, the actual percent saturation of hemoglobin is 75%. But that 75% is no longer in the arterial blood. That 75% there, right there, is specifically the 75% saturated hemoglobin is for the venous blood but even more specifically for the systemic or peripheral venous blood, okay? So now, what am I trying to tell you here? Let's say I utilize this a calculation. So at 104 millimeters of mercury, which is the systemic arterial blood's partial pressure of oxygen, the percent saturation of hemoglobin is 98%. Okay, cool, let me utilize that number then. So 98% saturation of hemoglobin in what? And I'm gonna put AB for the arterial blood. Okay, this is for the arterial blood. I'm gonna subtract that from the saturation of hemoglobin after the gas exchange has occurred in the venous blood. So now this is the mixed venous blood, right? This is approximately 75% after the gas exchange occurs at the tissues. So this is at 75% saturation of hemoglobin but this is specifically after the gas exchange has occurred. So now this is in the venous blood. What, what do I mean here? Let me, let, me, let me give you guys a little diagram, uh, diagram here. Let's say here I have a capillary, which goes to a tissue cell, and you know that the capillaries will feed into this tissue cell, and you know, you'll have your arterial, you'll have your capillary bed, and then you'll have your venule. And then you know over here you're gonna have your tissue cells. So let's say here I have a couple tissue cells. What did we say was happening in the internal respiration? We said oxygen was moving where? We said oxygen was coming from the hemoglobin. So let's say that this is the oxyhemoglobin. What was he doing? He was dropping off oxygen to the tissues. As he was dropping off oxygen to the tissues, the tissues were producing CO2. And what was happening? The CO2 was binding onto the hemoglobin and causing oxygen to be letting go of the, uh, the I'm sorry, letting, having the hemoglobin let go of the oxygen. What was the percent saturation of that hemoglobin at that point, right before he starts dropping off the oxygen? It's approximately 98%. But then, when it drains out of the capillary bed, what is the uh, concentration of the hemoglobin afterwards? So I'm gonna put deoxyhemoglobin. We have a very little oxygen, but this is deoxy. So if this is, uh, if this is oxy, guys, what would this be? R state. If this is deoxy, this is T state. Okay. What would the uh, hemoglobin saturation be after it's drained from the capillary beds? Well, if we assume that the partial pressure of oxygen here in the tissues, the muscle tissues, for example, is 40 millimeters of mercury, well, then we said the percent saturation at that point in time leaving should be 75%. Now, the question is, 
when I subtract these two, when I take the difference between these two, what am I actually obtaining? Well, I'm obtaining how much oxygen was being unloaded to the tissue cells. That's it. So I'm actually calculating the percent oxygen being unloaded. So if I do the difference here, 8 minus 5 is 3, 9 minus 7 is 2, that's going to be approximately 23%. Per percent of what? Of oxygen unloaded. Sweet deal. That's a cool thing. Now, let me do something different. Let's say I take, for example, a tissue, the same tissue. It was originally at rest. And now let's say that I amp its metabolic rate up. And what would cause that? Exercise. Let's just say, for example, I'm exercising. And I'm going ham. I'm going to hit biceps and triceps today. I'm going to get those, you know, I'm going to get that nice little tricep. All right? I don't have any, but anyway, we're coming back here. And look what happens. He starts exercising. This individual starts exercising. And look what happens to the partial pressure of oxygen. It goes from 40, and let's say that he's working out hard, and it drops down to about 20. So let's say it goes from 40 to 20. So let's say at this point here, we're taking the tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen of the tissues, but specifically during vigorous exercise. So let's say that this person is exercising, exercising really, really hard. They're hitting the glamour muscles, they're hitting the triceps and the biceps today. All right, now, if that's the, ca if that's the case, and they're utilizing so much oxygen, so what do I mean by they're, they're utilizing a lot of oxygen? Let's say, for example, I take this tissue cell. If its metabolic rate is increasing, it's going to want to utilize more oxygen. So it's going to produce more CO2, right? Which is going to cause more oxygen to be unloaded. As it produces more CO2 and more protons, you guys remember from the internal respiration video that that caused that Bohr effect. It weakened the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin, and oxygen was let go. Well, the more CO2 you produce, the more H plus you produce, what was the other molecule? The more 2 comma 3 BPG you produce, and what else? The more higher the temperature. This is going to weaken that bond between the oxygen and the hemoglobin. It's going to let go of more oxygen. The more oxygen you let go of, that tissue cell is going to continue to keep metabolizing it and utilizing it to make energy. Now, let's follow this bad boy up and see where it goes. So I come here at 20, and look what happens here. Holy moly. That is a huge difference. I went from 75% all the way down to 30%. Now, obviously, this isn't perfect, but you guys get the point. Obviously, this wouldn't be as significant. It might drop down to about 55%, but if we go to 20 and we move our way up, move over, oh, wow, 30%. Let's do that calculation. So let's say we take the situation here. Now, don't, don't worry about this one anymore. We're not going to compare this one for right now. We're still going to look at the systemic arterial blood, and we're going to look at the actual changes when it's at 20 millimeters of mercury, and we'll compare it to the resting tissue. Okay, so don't worry about this for right now. Let's only focus on this one. So let's come over here and do that. So say, for example, I start off with, again, my 98%. And that 98% is for what, again, guys? It's the 98% saturation of hemoglobin. But where? In the arterial blood. Good. Now we're going to subtract the difference between what? At 20 millimeters of mercury, when our, our tissues in our vigorous exercise, we go up, boom, 30%. Still blows my mind, but that's just the graphical representation of it here. 30%. Percent. percent what? Saturation of hemoglobin, but where? In the venous blood. And again, what did I mean by that? Again, take that example. Here's my capillary. I might be beating a dead horse, but I just want you guys to really get the point here. Let's say here's my tissue cell. And if here's my tissue cells, and again, what's happening to these tissue cells? They're taking up a lot of oxygen. And why are they taking up a lot of oxygen? Because they're producing massive amounts of CO2. They're producing massive amounts of protons. They're producing massive amounts of 2 comma 3 BPG. They're producing uh, lots of temperature in the form of thermal energy. And what is that doing to the hemoglobin? It's decreasing the affinity for oxygen. So where's oxygen going to go? It's going to disassociate and it's going to go to the tissues, and it's going to go to the tissues enough to where these tissues can utilize that oxygen to produce massive amounts of ATP. Why, did, why do muscles need ATP? To contract. So that's why this is happening. Now let's take and do the difference now. So now if I take 98% and I subtract 
30%, what is that gonna be? Well, this is gonna give me eight, and this is gonna give me 68%. But 68% what? Oxygen unloaded to the tissues. That's a lot. Okay, so if we compare, if we compare this right here, 68% of oxygen unloaded, but when? Let's even be more specific. During exercise versus over here, 33% of the oxygen that's unloaded when what? When we're resting. Chilling out, watching Breaking Bad or the new prison break, love that. And you're just killing it, eating some potato chips. And then what is that percentage of oxygen going to be? Unloaded, 23%. But this is just at rest. That's a significant difference. If we compare the difference between these two, that's a huge difference. 68% and 23%, that's a huge difference. What's the overall concept here? Here's what it is. Now we're going to talk about this pink line and this orange line here. Okay. So here's what you're notice. You probably have noticed here. You've seen a shift, right? A little bit of a shift. Here's our normal, right? And I told you that we would talk about this pink one, we talk about this orange one. Well, you'll notice here a shift this way, and you'll notice that this line shifts this way. Okay, let's talk about the one that's shifting towards the right. What do I notice right away? Let's compare here at resting tissue, the normal versus the resting tissue in this pink line. Okay, well at resting tissue, what do we know was the actual percent here? Well, it's 23%. Let's bring that over there. So it was 23% oxygen unloaded at rest in normal scenarios. Okay, so I'm just going to put situations here, okay? Now, let's take, for example, what it would be if we utilize this same thing here, but we stop right there now. If we're not going to this black line, we're going to that part of the pink line where it crosses. And now let's move over with that. So if we come right here to this point where it intercepts and we move over, it takes you to about 60%, about. So now let's do that calculation. If we do that calculation, and again, it starts with 98% saturated hemoglobin, always 98% saturation of hemoglobin in what? The arterial blood. And we take the difference of the percent saturation of hemoglobin when it was actually with this pink curve, which we haven't talked about yet. And it was about 60%. So let's take a difference of 60% saturation of hemoglobin, but this is after gas exchange, which means it's in the vein venous blood, the mixed venous blood. If that's the case, then what's the difference going to be? This is going to be approximately 8 minus this is 8, and then this is 38%. So 38% oxygen unloaded, okay, at this resting point, at this resting point in, let's say for this case, the pink curve. Okay. What's the difference then? more oxygen was unloaded in that pink curve. If we compare here, this is our pink curve here. And this is the one that was actually in the black curve. There was a lot more oxygen unloaded to the tissue cells whenever it was in this curve because it's shifting to the right. What could that be due to? You know what it's due to? If you guys remember the Bohr effect, this is due to the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect is due to a shift right, they call it, right? So it's shifting to the right of the curve. And what does that mean? That means then there has to be some situation that's causing more oxygen to be unloaded at the same partial pressure of oxygen when it's at normal versus some other condition. What is that condition? That is when there's a lot of protons. So your body's producing a lot of protons, right? Your actual cells are producing a lot of CO2. There's actually going to be a lot of 2 comma 3 BPG, biphos bisphosphoglycerate, right? I'm sorry, biphosphoglycerate. And there's also going to be an increase in temperature. And these situations in which there is a decreased affinity for oxygen, who? For, from hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is going to decrease. What's the overall situation? There's going to be a lot more oxygen leaving the hemoglobin and going into the tissues. That's the concept with this curve. So this curve is supposed to represent the Bohr effect. And all the Bohr effect is representing is the shift right from the normal curve 
and it's indicating that at the same, you take the normal curve at 40 millimeters of mercury, the percent saturation is 75. You take that, that same pa partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury in this Bohr effect curve, it's at 60. And that's due to more protons, more CO2, more 2,3 BPG, more temperature. All of these things are going to weaken the bond between oxygen and hemoglobin, which is going to cause more disassociation. So what's the overall effect of this? Increased oxygen dissociation. Okay. That's the whole concept of the Bohr effect. Now let's look to this situation in which there is a shift left. So now let's take this scenario in which this actual curve is shifting to the left now. So now this curve is shifting to left. If we take this situation here and we compare it now, so let's go 40 millimeters of mercury to this guy, 40 millimeters of mercury to the normal one, let's go up one more and follow it over. Okay, and then boom, 85%. Okay, so this point here, it's at about 85%. Let's do that math one more time, and then we're going to compare this and finish up the video. Okay, so again, normal saturation of hemoglobin is 98% in the arterial blood. So let's keep going off with that one. So 98% saturation hemoglobin in arterial blood, AB, right? Now we're subtracting the difference between the saturation of hemoglobin, which is approximately 85% saturation of hemoglobin in the venous blood. In other words, after the gas exchange occurs. We're going to take the difference between these two. If we take the difference between these two, again, what do you get? You're going to get 3, 13%. 13% uh, what? 13% of the oxygen is unloaded into the tissues. So if there's 13% of the oxygen unloaded to the tissues, that's not as much oxygen as normal. So 13% oxygen is unloaded to the tissues. So what is causing the situation where oxygen doesn't want to leave? Well, it must be some situation in which there's a high affinity that hemoglobin has for oxygen. So wouldn't that be the exact opposite of this? Yeah, that's what it is. You know what they call that? They call that the Haldane effect. So they call this scenario the Haldane effect. And you guys remember this. We talked about it in external and internal respiration. What's the overall concept then? It's just going to take the exact opposite. So now if it's the exact opposite, let's say here for the Haldane effect, we're going to want to have low CO2 presence, right? We're going to have low presence of protons. We're going to have what? Very little, 2, 3, BPG. It's going to be cold as ever, decreased temperature. And what's going to happen to the oxygen presence? The oxygen presence is going to be very, very high. So there must be a lot of oxygen here. If there is a lot of oxygen, so in other words, in the Haldane effect, because there's decreased CO2, decreased protons, decreased 2, 3 BPG, decreased temperature, the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen must be higher. So what does that mean then? If hemoglobin wants to hold on to the oxygen, it's not going to want to disassociate as much. So the whole effect of this is there will be a decrease oxygen dissociation. That's the overall effect of this. Okay. So in this video we talked a lot about a lot of different things. Okay, we went over a lot of this with the graphical representation of the Bohr effect, the Haldane effect, and the normal external and internal respiration doing a lot of boring math. But I hope it made sense, guys. I really hope you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, please hit the like button, subscribe, put a comment down in the comment section. All right, guys. Until next time, Ninja Nerds.